Okay. Right. Go ahead and get started. So, welcome to the uh, Polytechnic School Distinguished Lecture Series. This is the inaugural uh, lecture. Dr. Ladani decided to set up this series. So, we're going to be bringing in speakers that are of broad interest, to, especially all the graduate students on our campus. And uh, today, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Steve Piori. I've known Steve, I guess we decided since 1999 at some new factors meeting. Um, he, is at, he is the director of the Cognitive Sciences Laboratory and professor with the University of Central Florida's Cognitive Science Program and the Department of Philosophy, which is interesting, the School of Modeling, Simulation, and Training. He maintains a multidisciplinary research interest that incorporates aspects of cognitive, social, organizational, and computational sciences in the investigation of learning and performance in individuals and teams. And I'll just do some highlights because some of you have already seen this bio. Uh, he does, he's very much into interdisciplinary study. In fact, he was on the International uh, Academy's study panel with me on the science of team science. And so he, was, um, he and I spent a lot of time working on that report. He um, also was nominated in 2018 to DARPA's Sciences and Technology Study Group to help the DOD examine future areas of technological development potentially influencing national security. He's done a lot of international collaborations. Um, he's contributed beyond the team science report to the National Academies. He is a recipient of UCF's Luminary Award in recognition for his work having a significant impact on the world. UCF's Reach for the Stars Award is recognition for bringing international prominence to the university. He has uh, a prolific research program uh, managing approximately $25 million in research funding. He's co author on many books. So we'd like to introduce Steve Fiore to talk about his passion. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy, and thanks for this opportunity to come talk about uh, something about which I am passionate because Nancy asked uh, or told me, she said, you know, talk about your passion, what it is that makes you passionate about research. Uh, and I am passionate about problem solving, and it's at uh, both the practice of scholarship and uh, also at this more meta level. So given the audience and the nature of this talk, I, I decided to do it more at a meta level instead of getting into weeds or experiments to give more of a broad uh, kind of spectrum of what I've been doing over the last year or so. So I'll be talking about the meta-scientific context that is why I pursue research the way I do, what motivates me to solve problems the way I do, and then get into some examples of specific projects that my colleagues and I have been uh, developing within this context of scientific collaboration. And you see that graphic there on the right, that's my attempt to represent this meta-scientific perspective and this approach that I've been pursuing with regard to how to pursue science. So there's this idea that we have this scientific ecosystem. You have government agencies and non-government agencies out there that uh, reflect on society, reflect on problems. They, pr they produce reports about that, that lead to funding, that leads to these kinds of synthesis research efforts that scientists go through, that leads to empirical research that we pursue. And we all contribute to the scientific ecosystem in different ways, and we choose how to contribute to them but the main point I want to get across here, particularly to the graduate students, is you can have a lot more influence on this scientific ecosystem than you think you can. And this was something that I learned early on in my career by paying attention to science policy, that they, they really want help. You know, that you have people in these federal agencies who are not unlike us and they're wrestling with difficult problems and they don't want the scientists just sitting at their desk waiting for the request for proposals. You know, they want us to inform, they want us to contribute, they want us to help them shape these policies. So what I wanted to decide to talk about was how my colleagues and I have been involved in that for a number of years now. So with that as kind of the foreground, the first thing I want to provide is some perspective, this meta-scientific pr perspective, uh, distinguishing between basic versus applied science. And uh, I'll be talking a lot about episodic memories. And this is an episodic memory of mine when I got my very first competitive grant. I had just graduated with my PhD, and this was a grant from the precursor to the Department of Homeland Security. This was shortly after 9-11, and it was a basic science grant uh, in the area of security screening. 
but it was about perceptual learning and perceptual expertise. They wanted us to understand how do you accelerate the development of expertise, of expertise for people in the security screening task. But the program manager, when we had our kickoff meeting, he says, you know, this is basic science, but I want you to understand that although it's basic science, you're solving a very real world problem. And he wanted to juxtapose this with the way we usually think about basic science. So he explained to me some of his thinking. And when I started doing my own research, it's when I realized that everything we think about research in the U.S. can primarily lay at the, at the feet of Vannevar Bush in this report that was published in 1945, Science, the Endless Frontier. So this was a policy piece that Vannevar Bush wrote at the request of President Roosevelt. Vannevar Bush led the World War II Science and Technology Initiative. Roosevelt realized that science basically helped us win the war and said, I want to continue funding science after the war. I think there's a lot of good that can come from this, but he needed a model. Vannevar Bush was a very brilliant uh, scholar. If you're not familiar with him, I really recommend you look into his work. Um, actually, he wrote a piece for the Atlantic that many people credit with the envisioning what the internet would look like. It was called As We May Think. I really recommend you read that. It's a great piece. Um, but he wrote Science is the Endless Frontier, and he essentially codified the federal funding model that we have today that looks at basic uh, to applied science as a kind of continuum. Uh, at best a continuum, usually more like a dichotomy. And he made this point that the US government needs and is obligated to fund research because out of basic science, great things will emerge. So that's kind of the foundation, but back to the program manager who was educating me about this grant. He says, I don't want you to think like that. So I want you to think about basic science in the context of use. And he introduced to me the book, Past Year's Quadrant. So, you know, being a, a good little grantee, I went and bought the book and read it. And it was fascinating because it really opened my eyes about the way science policy is created and the ideas that go behind creating the kinds of requests for proposals that we see. And what Don Stokes wrote about was the need to think about science funding in a different way. He said, thinking about basic and applied research is missing. It creates this tension between researchers. We shouldn't think about it this way. Uh, we should consider the use for the science, but we should also obviously think about the quest for fundamental understanding. So basic science is really all about this quest for fundamental understanding. You know, you're trying to create knowledge, essentially for the sake of knowledge, but what Don Stokes said is you can still do that while taking into account the consideration for use. So it had this kind of two by two matrix that considered the use, yes, no, and like, were you on a quest for fundamental understanding? And the one quadrant in that two by two matrix was what he called Pasteur's quadrant. And he used Louis Pasteur as the quintessential example of use inspired basic science. So Pasteur was out there. He basically was, created the field of microbiology, but he was trying to solve real world problems. He wanted to solve disease, he wanted to prevent diseases so he invented knowledge, but he also solved real world problems. And in past year's quadrant, Don Stokes really said, we need to think about uh, the federal funding model along these lines and, and not only consider a quest for fundamental understanding. And it was interesting to see the influence this book had on funding because the National Science Foundation was created after Science the Endless Frontier came out. There was a lot of debate about the uh, basic science research and NSF came out of that debate. But when Pasteur's quadrant uh, was written, you started to see influence where NSF is still the quintessential basic science agency. But if you look at their programs, they now are all focused on problems. They all now have a kind of consideration for use. So there's not necessarily only a program on psychology or social psychology, there are programs on learning. Uh, so learning is a problem, it's not a discipline. So they're saying what, what the shift that we're seeing happening is they want people to focus on a consideration for use, still do basic science in that context, but think about how that basic science is gonna be used to solve real world problems. And um, I became kind of a science policy standpoint of I enjoyed reading these things, it was helpful in understanding science policy and spoiler alert, the 
one of the reasons that I can win grants is because I understand why they write, write these RFPs. So I actually read what these people are thinking and it gives me insight into the problems they're trying to solve. So by reading this policy, I get a sense of what they want. Say, hey, look, I can solve this problem for you. I understand the problem that you're trying to solve. I understand the need that you're trying to address. So the grants get written in such a way that I'm not, I'm not simply an egghead academic saying, I want to do research. I'm a scholar who understands the problem. I understand the scientific literature in such a way that I can tailor the grants along those lines. So I put up some quotes that had some uh, influence on my early thinking here. So Dan Sarowitz, uh, some of you may know him because he's here at ASU. He's the director of the Center for Science Policy and Outcomes. And um, he was introduced to me through my Washington DC network a number of years ago. And Dan kind of uh, sent me in the right direction for some ideas and articles to read. And he talked about the need for science policy to have similar democratic ideals where we think about the pursuit of science and the translation of scientific findings to meet societal goals. And Sarah, Sarah was talked about how when scientists work with activists, with stakeholders, science benefits and the community society benefits as well. Dave Gustin talked about this idea of a reciprocal relationship between science and practice and how stakeholders should inform science and the development of RFPs, that is the, the kinds of science that we want to be pursuing. Uh, Louis Branscombe similarly wrote about this when he talked about the need for boundary spending across the science policy community, across the stakeholder community, and the scholarly community. So these ideas really set the stage, set the foundation for the way I think about doing research. So this is kind of my simplistic framework about the scientific ecosystem that moves between these problems that are out there, scientific and societal problems, the needs of the agencies that are uh, monitoring society and that exist for the purposes of solving societal and scientific problems, the kind of meta-level synthesis research that we as scholars do to help these agencies understand these problems, and then that translates to the empirical research that we do as academics in the university setting where we're trying to solve these problems. So this is, what I'm going to talk about now is my contributions to these, to these kinds of problems, to these kind of problem solving from this academic perspective, how I've come into various these different areas and these different nodes or entry points. So um, what I want to talk about next is my motivation for solving problems the way I do. And Nancy mentioned that I'm an interdisciplinary researcher and there's a, there's a reason I link interdisciplinarity with problem solving, particularly with collaborative problem solving. And that's best illustrated by this quote by Karl Popper, so the noted historian philosopher of science. He really nailed it uh, over half a century. Disciplines are distinguished partly for historical reasons and reasons of administrative convenience, such as the organization of teaching. All this classification and distinct distinction is a comparatively unimportant and superficial affair. We are not students of some subject matter, but students of problems, and problems may cut across the borders of any subject matter or discipline. So those of you who have done any kind of serious inquiry into particular areas, this quote should resonate with you. You should quickly come to realize that you're not going to solve these kinds of complicated problems by taking a unidisciplinary perspective. You really need to look at these from a, a multi-method kind of perspective. And if you really want to do that, you quickly run up into the problem of the university structure, and that's illustrated by the second quote here. What's critical to realize is that the way universities have divided up the sciences does not reflect the way nature has divided up its problems. So university departments are structured around disciplines. Nature doesn't give a damn about disciplines. Disciplines are social constructs. We invented disciplines largely in the 20th century, like Popper said, for academic convenience, because we wanted to teach in certain areas of expertise. But the artifact of that is the belief that disciplines are real phenomena. The belief, this reification of disciplines as a concept precludes our ability to work across disciplines, to work across departments. So from the standpoint of interdisciplinarity and collaborative problem solving, we need to overcome these academic norms that stifle collaboration across disciplines. And ASU is probably the last place I need to be making this argument because Michael Crow got this. And when I became a science policy wonk, his work came into under my radar and I started reading what he was saying. And before he wrote his book about the new American university, he was publishing his commentaries 
And I read one of his commentaries he published in Nature, and he kind of nailed it with regard to this quote with Karl Popper. And he said, I think universities should focus on problems. He says, I want to create centers where people from different disciplines are focused on problems. And he's done that. So love him or hate him, he's, you know, he's got a model of the way we should do research. And it's based upon this kind of thinking. You know, let's bring people together to solve complex problems. So with, uh, since I'm talking a lot about collaborative problem solving, I wanted to give a little bit of a definition of collaborative cognition and what I mean when I talk about collaborative problem solving. So when we talk about problem solving, there's an unknown out there. There's a gap that needs to be filled. There's goals or objectives that need to be met to generate some kind of solution. Collaboration comes in because we bring in people with different areas of expertise. There's roles assigned based upon that expertise. There's interdependence among those roles that so you couldn't solve that problem without the complementary expertise of people on that team. So the collaboration is key. There's knowledge coordination, there's behavioral coordination, all those things need to be fit together for the purposes of coming up with unique solutions, for the purposes of creating knowledge that didn't exist before. So that's kind of an opera operationalization of collaborative problem solving at uh, the more higher level. But this is a very real world problem. So it's not just a scientific issue, it's a societal issue. And we see complex collaborative problem solving across many industries. So across domains, you see people in industry and academia working in teams. They're either face-to-face -face or, or working with people around the country or around the world. And they're all contributing to professional, professional disciplinary expertise. They're collaborating to produce new knowledge. And the argument that I, I make at this more meta level is we need to build from a strong foundation of theory coming out of different disciplines whether that be psychology, whether that be organizational sciences, whether that be computer science, all these different fields that have been studying, studying collaboration and teamwork in different ways, we need to unite these perspectives if we really want to seriously think about solving the world's problems. So what I've been doing is working with people to understand collaborative problem solving across different types of teams. I've been working with people to think about how can we train collaborative problem solving and how can we build technologies in support of collaborative problem solving. So now linking that with this notion of passion, I read this article um, a number of years ago, and I really liked it because they made, a, I think, an important. Okay. Um, so of all places, this article was published in Harvard Business Review. And that's ironic for the following reason. It was about pursuing your passion, but the passion you're pursuing is helping others. Specifically, it says, forget about finding your passion. Instead, focus on finding big problems. Putting problems at the center of decision-making changes everything. It's not about the self anymore. It's about what you can do and how you can be a valuable contributor. People wor working on the biggest problems are compensated in the biggest ways, in a deeply human sense. For one, it shifts your attention from you to others and the wider world. You stop dwelling. You become less self-absorbed. Ironically, we become happier if we worry less about what makes us happy. And I think that's important because in my generation, we are always taught, pursue your passion. And that was really kind of a selfish way to think about things because it was focused on the self. But what this person was arguing, and I agree with, is pursue problem solving, pursue the needs of society, and you'll feel happier, you'll be happier if you do that because you're helping others. And that's, again, at this higher level, this motivation that I have that guides the research I'm doing because I'm trying to understand complex problems and help people understand complex problems. And as part of that, this is now back into my area of scholarship, what uh, has been guiding a lot of my work is this notion of what we refer to as macro cognition in teams. And this is a concept, a theoretical framework that came out of funding from the Office of Naval Research. Uh, Nancy was actually a collaborator on this. We had funding um, for a MURI, a multidisciplinary university research initiative. And it was on this notion of macrocognition. And the way it evolved was developing this framework for collaborative problem solving. And this framework at a meta level has important theoretical elements. So the first one is it's multi-level in the sense that you think about the individual and the individual's interaction at the team level. It also talks about internalized and externalized cognitive functions. So it's not simply about problem solving with what's inside the head of a problem solver. It's about problem solving as it extends across 
problem solvers, as it is distributed across people and how that cognition leaves the head and gets into the world to develop, for example, the kind of shared understanding that we know is important for collaboration more generally. And the model also takes into account the temporal characteristics associated with problem solving. When people come together to solve a problem, what they should do is first try and define the problem. There's the old management axiom, a problem defined is half solved. That's true. If you spend your time trying to define a problem, you're more likely to come up with a solution that's going to work. The reality is most problem solving teams don't do that. If you've ever been on a university committee, invariably you sit down and they try to generate solutions right away. But if you have a wise person on that committee, they're gonna say, well, wait, do we all understand what the problem is in the first place? And that's a ubiquitous issue. It doesn't matter what kind of problem you're trying to deal with, whether it's something to do with university administration or a real world problem like cybersecurity, you need to first define that problem. So from the phasic standpoint and the macrocognition and teams model, we look at how teams move through these phases. They first try to define the problem, develop a shared model of that problem, then they try to come up with solutions for that problem, notional solutions, then they'll debate those solutions. Is this the right way to do it? They'll argue about those solutions and they'll see the degree to which the solutions they choose actually meet the objectives of addressing that problem. So this has guided a, a number of areas of research for me. So the idea is that you can look at this not simply to help people solve problems, but we can also think about how can we develop technologies to support collaborative problem solving. So each one of these becomes kind of an entry point for a kind of a technology intervention. How can you help get knowledge into the world? How can we help externalize knowledge? How can we help these knowledge building processes where they debate about ideas in such a way that they're more likely to come up with accurate problem solving solutions? So enough with the meta level kind of issues. Now I'm gonna move into a specific example that I've been working on with my colleagues in the area of collaborative problem solving. And getting back to this more, uh, this framework of the scientific ecosystem, and I mentioned that I'll talk a lot about episodic memories. This episodic memory goes back about a decade when I was invited to give a talk at the National Academies of Sciences where they were working on, they had a committee that was trying to understand what they were referring to as 21st century skills. So one of the National Academies committees was brought together to think about, okay, you know, it's a brand new century. We have brand new kinds of work. What are the kinds of competencies? What are the kinds of skills that we need to be thinking about for success in the new workplace? Because we want to identify those competencies and push them back into the educational system to make sure students are learning these kinds of competencies. So I was brought there to talk about collaboration and teamwork and interpersonal skills. And you know, I, uh, if you're familiar with the way the National Academies works, what they do is they bring a committee together to think about the problem. That committee identifies speakers to come in and inform the way they think about these problems. Those uh, produce reports based upon that particular problem. But the episodic memory here is the dinner conversations that we had as members that were invited to talk. While there, I met some people who were working on a different but related problem. Those people were working on problem solving at the international level. They were actually working with the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development on the program in international student assessment. That's called PISA. And if uh, Everyone knows about PISA, even if they don't know that they know about it. So every few years, you'll see a headline in the New York Times that says, the United States ranks fifth in reading. So that kind of data comes from the PISA. It comes from the Program in International Student Assessment. And I met some people who were working on the 2012 assessment, which they had a separate section. So every time they do the PISA, they add a different area. In 2012, the new area was problem solving. So, you know, I had fun talking to them, but the point here is they said 2015 is gonna be on collaborative problem solving. So like a little puppy panning at the door, I'm like, hey, can I help? I wanna work on that with you. So I started to talk more with them and they explained to me the way the piece of process works. So they developed these frameworks. So much like the National Academies, they recruit people to develop a synthesis of a phenomena and they developed uh, a framework associated with problem solving in 2012. And I just thought I'd uh, give you all the scores. So um, the US didn't even rank um, in problem solving in 2012. 
Singapore always shows up at the top in all of these assessments. If you buy me a beer, I'll tell you why. Um, but with the way uh, PISA works is they bring together people from around the world. They think about what is the problem we're trying to address. They develop a framework and then they develop the assessment instruments based upon that. So uh, because I met these people uh, at this meeting uh, and they were familiar with my work on collaborative cognition, I became one of a set of people who worked on the collaborative problem solving framework for the 2015 assessment. So I was just one small part of this larger group. So there was a core group of members who had to travel to um, Europe numerous times a year, deal with the OECD. It's actually run out of France. Uh, if you're not familiar with OECD, it goes back to World War II. So just like Vannevar Bush wrote Science on the Frontier, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development was created based upon the Marshall Plan. So remember the Marshall Plan when we invested millions of dollars to rebuild Europe? They decided, well, how can we be sure that the money we're using is actually producing the kind of change that they want? So the OECD was created to actually monitor development in countries around the world. And as part of that, they measure educational progress in countries around the world. So it's headquartered in France, and this, this core member group worked with our, this extended group. Uh, so we were the outside experts who were working with them to develop this theoretical framework for assessing collaborative problem solving. And that was to be administered in 2015. So what we did is we developed a framework. So this is the synthesis research that we were hired to produce for the 2015 framework. So we essentially looked at the literature on collaborative problem solving. We identified a set of comp uh, competencies that we think are related to collaborative problem solving. And we ended up linking that with the 2012 assessment on problem solving. And the 2012 assessment on problem solving had these four major areas that there's this notion of exploring and understanding, there's representing and formulating, there's planning and executing, and there's monitoring and reflecting. Then we looked at the collaboration needs associated with problem solving and distilled all the literature that was out there and came up with these three major categories. First, there's this need to establish and maintain a shared understanding. There's the need to take appropriate action to solve the problems. There's a need to establish and maintain organization as members of a team. And with this framework, a set of competencies within each of these cells were identified. So when you match maintaining shared understanding with exploring and understanding, here you have discovering perspectives and abilities of team members. Then you have building a shared representation, negotiating the meaning of the problem. You know, so this is all the shared problem model development kind of competencies. So what they then did was they took this framework and then outlined a rubric for what it would mean to be competent at different levels for each one of these cells. And then they developed a test for this. And this is now way beyond my level of competence because this was a test that had to be administered around the world given to hundreds of thousands of students around the world in different languages, dozens of different languages. And this is, this is a case study in collaborative problem solving itself. How they were able to accomplish this is really impressive. So they worked with, their, with, the, uh, with Pearson, they worked with scholars around the world, they worked with psychometricians, and they came up with this collaborative problem solving assessment. And they studied and they collected data from students around the world. So it was administered in 2015. The report didn't come out until 2017. And lo and behold, they found that about 10% of students around the world were any good at collaborative problem solving. So remember I said they developed this rubric. They had uh, objective metrics of what it meant to be a good collaborative problem solver from one uh, being the lowest level, four being the highest level. So only about 10% of students scored at this highest level. That is, they can engage in uh, competencies like monitoring group behavior, uh, identifying the roles for each other, resolving conflict. 30% of students were at the lowest level, 30% in the member countries. Basically, they could only focus on simple problem elements or simple kinds of problems, and they maintained an individual focus whenever they did work on a collaborative problem solving task. So, <clears throat> Some colleagues and I, we were waiting for this report to come out because we didn't really think 
students were going to do too well because, you know, we're educators and we monitor collaborative problem solving. So we were kind of anticipating this. And we used this as an opportunity to focus on what we saw as a significant scientific and societal problem. So we moved from the piece of report, the empirical research, we looked at the data that came out there. And last year we uh, published this commentary in Nature Human Behavior where we basically said, the world's screwed. We have a bunch of incompetent problem solvers around the globe. We need to do a better job teaching students how to work collaboratively to solve problems. So we wrote this commentary that basically said you need to, inf you need to formalize methods of instruction, you need to formalize methods of feedback, and the difference here is the instruction is about collaboration. The feedback is about collaboration. Students rarely re receive feedback in the classroom about their teamwork. The feedback they get is about what we refer to as task work. Did you solve the problem? Did you complete your group project? It doesn't, you don't rarely, you rarely get a grade on how well did you collaborate. So we wanted to call attention to this and we wanted to note that this is a global problem. So we, you know, we published it in one of the nature journals because we wanted to have this kind of global reach. But we also wanted to inform society more generally. So I wrote a blog for The Conversation. Uh, with, you're not familiar with it. The Conversation is one of these online magazines where they invite academics to write about real world uh, translations of scholarship. So uh, this was an important issue to me. I'm passionate about this issue. And the point here is collaborative problem solvers are made, not born. Here's what we need to do. So now this is attempting to educate the public that this is a significant issue and there's something that we need to do about it. So my colleagues and I continued with this issue because uh, the PISA assessment was able to identify the problem. That is the lack of competencies associated with collaborative problem solving. And we started to work with the US National Assessment of Educational Projects. So this is one of the divisions within the Department of Education. And because the PISA assessment only samples from students around the world, we wanted to turn that attention on the United States. We wanted to develop an assessment for US students and the National Assessment of Educational Progress actually is something administered to millions of students in the US. And we wanted to uh, call attention to this need to assess collaborative problem solving. And you know, as a, someone familiar with the educational system, we know if you're going to assess it, they're going to teach it. So this is kind of the underhanded way to, if you wanted to force a change in the curriculum, develop tests for that. And once you develop an assessment that the teachers know, and the counties and the administrators know they'll be tested on, then they'll implement change in the classroom and they'll start developing curriculum for that. So this was kind of the goal here, is we really wanted to solve this real world problem of low competencies in collaborative problem solving. And we did this by going to the federal agencies and saying, hey, you should really test collaborative problem solving competencies in students. So we wrote this for the federal agency, but we also uh, published a piece last year in Perspectives, um, Psychological Science in the Public Interest. So this is one of the APS journals. And it was about, again, advancing the science of collaborative problem solving. It was one of the synthesis research kinds of papers. Uh, where my colleagues and I looked across this landscape. What do we know about collaboration? And this, so this was the report uh, for the agency. This was really the report for scholars. So we basically took that kind of report that we wrote and said, now let's write it from an academic standpoint and be more formal about how to operationalize these issues. How can we identify the new research areas that we need to pursue if we want to address this issue of collaborative problem solving? So, you know, I'm serious about this. I do this because I think it's necessary to save the world. You know, there are significant uh, global problems and the only way we're gonna solve these is if we get better at collaborative problem solving. So I've been studying teams for a number of years now and my particular focus is on this area of collaborative problem solving. So it's not about teamwork in general, it's about how do we help people solve problems. So I've been working with a number of people around the world trying to uh, inform how do you understand collaborative problem solving? How do you assess collaborative problem solving? How do you educate and train people on collaborative problem solving? So the way we're arguing now is that we need to develop and implement instruction, practice, and feedback in the classroom and in the workplace in such a way that people learn how to become better collaborative problem solvers. So that's one of the buckets uh, that I've been focusing on. Um, 
Nancy mentioned the Science of Team Science. So um, how many people are familiar with Nancy's work in the Science of Team Science? Okay. Only about a third of you. Uh, so this is a, another area that my colleagues and I have been developing. Um, this goes back to around, we, we credit 2006, a workshop at the National Institutes of Health with the beginning of the Science of Team Science. That's when the NIH coined the phrase, the Science of Team Science. I got into this, again, this is now episodic kind of memory. I got into this because, again, working with Nancy, we, this was when we were developing the NSF grant, the expertise, the Center for the Study of Expertise. So this was, we were trying to develop a science of learning center focused on expertise. And we were bringing together people from around the country to develop a science of expertise. That is, the science of learning was a new NSF program. And we were arguing that if you really want to understand learning, you also should look at learning at the higher end of the continuum. You should also look at experts and what makes them experts so you can understand the trajectory to expertise. And when you understand that trajectory of expertise from novice to expert, you can then develop better educational programs. So that was the, the goal with the Science of Learning Center. It's relevant to the science of team science because I was co-PI on this grant and I was trying to figure out how do you get these scientists to work as a team? So it was a case study in interdisciplinary teamwork because we had scientists working on this from a number of different disciplines. And I was trying to figure out how do we get these people to bring their ideas together? You know, we had all these meetings, we we're trying to plan out our research. So I went to the literature on teamwork to see, have we ever studied scientific teams? And that's when the light bulb went off. It's like, holy crap. No, team researchers have never really studied scientific collaboration. There had been some work in the policy arena where they talked about it, but it wasn't really the kind of research that we as team uh, scholars would consider team science. So that's for me when the light bulb went off that, oh, this is a whole new area. So dove into the policy literature, discovered what NIH had been doing for a couple of years. So I wrote a grant to NSF. I said, look, this is a huge gap. This is a big problem. So I got funding for a workshop uh, uh, funded by NSF on how to bring together researchers from the policy community with researchers from the social and organizational sciences and say, we need to do a better job developing the science of team science because we have experts who study teams. We have funders who are funding teams, but we really don't get them to interact much. And we need to identify how do you understand expertise in scientific collaboration? How do you assess progress in scientific collaboration? So I actually wrote this uh, paper, Interdisciplinary as Teamwork, How the Science of Teams Can Inform Team Science, back in 2008. And that was largely kind of my retrospective on the expertise work, the Science of Learning Center that we were trying to develop, where I'm like, we can do better. We know a lot about teamwork, but we should inform scientific teamwork. I used this to market to NSF the funding to get this report here to, uh, to get this workshop funded. So I invited people from NIH and these federal agencies uh, to this workshop. We started collaborating and we started engaging in our own kind of synthesis research. So we published a commentary in one of the science journals where we looked at it from this multi-level systems perspective. We actually mapped out the research space. We mapped out the problem space for a science of team science. Uh, for trying to understand the big areas that needed to be explored for this. And then we use that to lobby the National Academies and say, hey, there needs to be a National Academies report. There needs to be a National Academies study on the science of team science. This is something of national importance. This, this is going to uh, help the scientific ecosystem. It's going to inform our federal agencies. It's going to inform scholarship. And they agreed, and Nancy he headed up that committee on the science of team science. We wrote this report, and uh, now what my colleagues are trying, to, my colleagues and I are trying to do now is get funding for the science of team science. So now taking that report and knocking on doors in Congress and saying, hey, will you give us some money so we can study this? So we're trying to advocate for a science of team science in such a way that now it goes back to the empirical research. Uh, and uh, I actually got a little bit of funding. I'll end on this one. I'm, how much time do I have? A half hour? Okay, how much time do you want for a discussion? Half an hour? Okay, <laughs> so I'll quickly go over this one. 
So um, a couple of years ago, I was invited to a workshop uh, by a group of researchers at the Virginia Institute for Marine Science. And they had heard about this thing called the Science of Team Science. And they said, oh, we do interdisciplinary work. Uh, let's have a workshop on it. So um, I love this photograph because it really illustrates this kind of collaborative problem solving uh, that I study. So here we have a group of experts sitting around a table. But you have these externalized cognition exemplified in this meeting where you have people writing on these kind of post-it notes, all the ideas, all the discussions that this is really a lot about ideation. So we're trying to map out the problem space for their problems at this center. And we're thinking about it, reflecting on it. And you know, there I am talking about teamwork. And here I was saying, well, what you're really talking about is interdependency. So I was bringing the theory into it. So here I was explaining Savidra et al.'s notion of interdependencies, complex interdependencies, pool interdependencies, trying to help them understand from the theoretical standpoint what they needed to understand if they wanted to get a handle on the kinds of problems that they solve. So we had some traction. We ended up writing a grant to NSF on how to improve graduate education and collaborative problem solving. And we're in the middle of that project now where we recruited students from around the country. This is in the uh, area of environmental sustainability research. So the goal of this grant is not simply to improve problem solving and sustainability science, but to improve collaborative problem solving and, the, and their scientific teamwork. So uh, I was brought in to focus on the collaboration part. So we had workshops where I told them about teamwork. I told them about the science of team science, but we also had an intervention based upon the study of teams more generally. And this was uh, some work I had done in the laboratory with Catherine Gabelica and colleagues where we were studying how team reflection or with a team reflexivity can improve collaboration. This is kind of a generic intervention where basically just like education researchers know that metacognition improves learning, we know that getting teams to reflect on their teamwork improves their collaboration. This was an intervention that had been developed and tested. So we, we implemented that for these graduate students. We assessed their project, uh, their progress using Tom O'Neill's care model of um, teamwork. And we had them work on real world problems. So this is now the societal problem solving. So this is the Chesapeake Bay region of the United States where they're worried about uh, sea level rise. They're worried about coastal resilience. So we work with stakeholders up there to develop real world problems for the students to try to solve. We had workshops where they not only tried to solve those problems, but they engaged in these kinds of reflexive activities about their collaboration. And based upon those reflective activities, we assessed the degree to which they were improving in their collaboration. Uh, so I just presented this last month at the transdisciplinary um, conference uh, that the Swiss hold. And this was just a simple subjective assessment where they reflect on their own teamwork and their teammates teamwork and showed that they were improving based upon the care model. And what we're going to do next is look at that in the context of objective measures of teamwork. So the students had to develop as an outcome for their project, a white paper. So remember, they're solving real world scientific problems. So they're thinking about this from an interdisciplinary standpoint. How are you going to deal with coastal resilience? How are you going to deal with this problems? And this is actually, I, I really love this, this group's bright, uh, white paper. I thought they did a really nice job linking both the, the science society, uh, economic systems, global needs in their conceptual framework for this problem. And that's just one example of the white papers that these student teams produce. We also collected their reflective activities. So after they engaged in teamwork each, at each one of these workshops, they had to step back and say, how did we do as a team? And we focused them on things like conflict management, on role clarity, on strategy formulation and planning. That is, these are the dimensions of teamwork that we thought were important for the collaborative problem solving. We had them reflect on, did they do that well or did they do that poorly? If they did it poorly, how could they improve? So we made them articulate, we made them get explicit about very specific things that they would do to improve that component of teamwork. So the next steps for this project, what we're gonna do is analyze their collaboration um, feedback assessment and look at the degree to which that's related to their um, uh, white papers. That is, were these teams both good at teamwork and at their problem solving? So I'll end it there.
the new grant they just got started, but okay. Thank So we wanted to thank you, Steve, for being our inaugural speaker. I'd like to first uh, thank you for coming here. It's an honor to have you here and be a presenter. It's very interesting. I have some questions on the math. But before uh, doing that, I'd like to present this fact, which is uh, a, uh, an appreciation of your distinguished lecture. Uh, thank you again for being here. Thank and, uh, you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. And um, so Robert, that's really going to lead the discussion in the answer period. Um, while he's coming up here, I just wanted to invite whoever is interested, the Barrio Brewing Company at 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock, where you can uh, discuss even further with uh, Dr. Fortuori. Get the real story once I've had a couple of <laughs> <laughs> My question. Yeah, you, you, so, you ever say you have questions, I'm going to point Yeah, you. I'm, uh, I'm an, kind of a number person. So, so when you said you had to run that global analysis problem and collaborative team working with students, mm -hmm. and you had like 10% of students on top of the there's the 30% poor performance performers, I wonder how the, what are the metrics or what are the, how did you measure that 10% as high? Yeah. Um, so remember, I was one of a very large team. So I was the theory guy working with the psychometricians. And based upon that four by three matrix that we developed for the theoretical framework for assessment, then they went in and identified how can we objectively measure the particular competencies associated with each one of these cells. So I have a link to the report where they explain all of this. So here are the actual levels of competence that were based upon that four by three framework that we had developed. So here at the highest level, students can successfully carry out complicated problem solving tasks uh, that are uh, of high collaborative complexity. Uh, they can solve complex problems with multiple constraints. So this is about the problem itself. And then you get into the collaboration component they maintain an awareness of group dynamics. They take action to ensure the team members act in accordance with their agreed upon roles. So basically, they're monitoring the teamwork, which we know is important for effective teams. They're aware of the roles on the team. So they know that we're like, okay, this is my job, this is your job. And then they, they monitor progress towards the solution. So are we uh, meeting our goals in order to su successfully solve problems? So this is the highest level of the rubric. And then it goes down there. So at the lowest level, uh, they can only work on problems low in complexity. They have limited collaboration uh, complexity. So basically, level one students can confirm actions or proposals made by others, but they tend to focus on their individual role within the group. Um, and when they work on simple problems, they may be able to help find a solution to a given problem, but they're not really collaborating or maintaining awareness at the group level. They're not really paying attention to what other people are doing. And uh, given the broad population that you talked about, uh, I would assume there would be some probably variations in different countries or different regions or different, I don't know if they, you did the analysis for like maybe gender analysis or, you know, country base or, you know, what are the, did you do that? Uh, they did. So, yes. And actually, um, it's a very interesting report. So, uh, females did a lot better. Uh, in collaborative problem solving. And then another part I didn't even mention is we also developed some surveys. So in addition to doing the assessment, they, so the, the tests are a sample of the population. Within that sample, they also administer surveys to a subset of people. And we um, made recommendations for the kinds of things that they should look at. So in addition to the, gen, the overall gender finding where females uh, were doing better at collaborative problem solving, uh, there were findings about student activity, 
and their belief in teamwork. So just your perception of teamwork was actually related to performance. And they also looked at things like, you know, were you in sports, were you in band, were you in these other kinds of activities? So um, I really recommend the report, but again, I'm a policy wonk, so I enjoy reading those kinds of things. Uh, but they did a nice job breaking everything down. And in fact, um, if you go to the OECD website, they also have a PDF of the presentations they gave. So the, a distillation, though. So that's where I got this. This is just a screenshot from one of their um, PowerPoints where they broke it down. So uh, the top is the country, right? And, uh, so these are the countries. So this is the students at level four. So Singapore, New, uh, New Zealand, Canada, they had the highest percentage of students. So about 20% of students in Singapore were scoring at level four. Uh, uh, only 10% were scoring at level one. Uh, the United States, uh, we had about 15% scoring it at level four. Uh, and I think we had uh, close to 30, or about 22% scoring at level one. Um, but it goes across the different countries to show how they did in this. It's, kind of, it's a lot of variation between the educational system to how people do things and the cultural background and a lot of things that affect these results. And so this is a very comprehensive study. And I mean, there's a lot that we can probably get from that, this study, figuring out how different educational systems work. I don't know what level these are, like students at high school? Yes, high, high school, school students. Um, perhaps you can maybe give up something about the educational systems. Any, 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 any effect from that side, maybe looking at different systems that these countries implement? And is that, does that have any impact on them? Or? Um, how do you, how do you well, rem remember who does this. So this yeah. is OECD. So this is a non-governmental transgovernmental organization. So I'll ask this question. How much influence do you think a transgovernmental organization has on not only a country, but the educational system no, within that country? Getting the background from them. So not to influence them, but maybe grab information, culture, background, yeah. education system, and that could be, uh, you can use that as an analysis. Right, so, I, so another way to say that is that there's a lot of data where, for example, students getting um, advanced degrees of PhD in education can say, hey, I'm going to do a study of Sing uh, Singapore, New Zealand, Canada, and compare that to Mexico, Turkey, and Tunisia, yeah. and see what's so different that they're at the high end and the low end of this, and see what is it about their educational practices that are producing students' variation along those lines. Yeah, that's a very interesting study. We yeah. have multiple variety of disciplines in our school, mm -hmm. one of them in engineering education and STEM um, education. So it's always very educational to see how different systems work. You know, it's yeah. helpful to have you know, an amazing education student in the US, but you know, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. you can You mentioned earlier about Singapore that you have some idea of how you got to the top. That, that's interesting. I used to work in Singapore in 1998. Well, you, you probably know better than me. <laughs> I only hear second and third hand. Um, I, well, I think the simple way is they teach to the test. Um, so the only way I think that these things get used is to market their country. So, you know, they, they look at these global indicators and they say, hey, if you want your business to be in one of the smartest countries, come to Singapore. Would you? Tailored. That's how they. Yeah. Yeah. Corporate America desperately needs this. Currently, our HR departments are in love with mandalas and color wheels. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> Sorry. Us approaching. And Bob is a toxic jerk who's constantly backstabbing the efforts because his department's budget is king. Mm -hmm. Do you see? to bridge some of the Game of Thrones, uh, corporate America, scientific community areas where people are focused on being adversarial as a way to it. Yeah, one thing um, I didn't get into in the interest of time is in this commentary, uh, I used data from corporate America. And there was a survey that the American Management Association ran a few years ago uh, that I was really impressed with because they 
uh, ask CEOs and business leaders, managers from companies around the country, how well are college graduates doing in a set of areas, some of which involve collaboration, teamwork, communication, working with people from different backgrounds. And they also ask recent college graduates, how well do you think you are in collaboration teamwork? And I use this to illustrate the huge disconnect. So managers, CEOs said these kids suck. These kids say, oh, I'm great at these things. So they have this kind of Dunning-Kruger problem. And the argument that I made in this commentary is all students have to go on is the feedback that they get in their undergraduate classes. And because they've been involved in so many group projects and they get a good grade on that group project, they conflate that with collaboration and teamwork when those are separable constructs. So there's task work and there's teamwork. And students are walking away with this incorrect mental model that because I got a good grade, because we solved that problem, that I am good at teamwork. And we know that's not always the case. So that was the first point that to argue and then to deal with corporate America, it was like, hey, if you want to be an efficient, effective company, here's the data from the organizational sciences to say, organizations that measure better at teamwork have 10% more profit or you know, are much better at this. So you have to hit them where they're interested in, which is profit. So talking about, um, like I said, feedback on teamwork, I guess two questions with that. I guess, is there an area that already does it well and in the education sense, is the feedback something that comes internally within a team or is there a way that an educator can interject as well? Because I know in engineering and a lot of the design classes, they have that component where you're rating your team. Like the, there is no, there was no breakdown like how that care project was, but it's like, how well would you rate your team? And then a lot of the classes I've had, that score that you get from your teamwork can also impact your grading. So, um, so are you asking, is there a particular measure that's been validated? I guess, how, how do you integrate teamwork feedback in the classroom and the design setting to start getting students to think about how they are working on a team and how does an educator also kind of input their opinion on it as well? Or does it have to come internally from the team? Uh, no, I, I think that if you want it, it to be implemented, um, it needs to be part of the grade, like you said, but it needs to be separable. And the way that we, uh, in the NSF grant that I mentioned, it was through the reflective practices. So we specifically identified uh, based upon this model of collaboration. So team researchers are no different than any academic. You know, we invent these measures because we need to get publications. So there are dozens of measures of teamwork out there. Um, when I give these kinds of talks, I recommend the ones that have been validated, that hit what are like the primary characteristics of collaboration. So the CARE model I thought was a decent one, you know, it not only had been validated in a number of different contexts, it hit what I saw as uh, the important components for collaborative problem solving. But the key is its accessibility. And the CARE model has an online system where you can sign up and put your teams in there and it will generate reports based upon the teams filling out the model. So it spits out a report that says, this is how well your team did, this is how well you think you were doing, this is how you, well your students or your uh, colleagues felt you were doing. So it's that kind of systematic intervention that will address, I think, this need to improve collaboration. So it's not a one-off thing, you have to give them a chance to practice their teamwork. They have to get feedback on teamwork. They have to reflect on that feedback, figure out how to do better, and then work as a team again, and then walk, look at it over time. So to follow that up, I'm curious about the folks that fall into this lower 340 and below category. Um, and it seems like, you know, you, the United States is, is pretty good in terms of the folks that are getting in the top category, but we also have a pretty big bar in that low category. And I wonder if there's not something like the dunning group that Dr. King has done with those lower folks that, where they don't realize that. And maybe this uh, feedback that you're talking about is a way to sort of intervene and address that. Is that the idea behind it? That somebody will just think, oh, I'm really good at collaborating, but they're terrible at collaborating. 
right. think that their hammer is, you know, everything is a nail for, the, for what they want to put into. Yes. I th I th so the, the key to any kind of feedback um, from my experience is you have them self-assess before you actually give them the feedback. So then they see that discrepancy, then yeah. they can maybe start to Because if you don't give them, if, once, if they see feedback without self-assessing, I don't think it has as big an impact. You know, it's not like a slap in the face. Like, oh crap, I'm a lot worse than I thought I was. Yes. Um, and I think what also matters is the iterative nature of the practice and feedback. You know, it's, you have to do it multiple times. And um, I don't know if anyone ever saw Randy Tausch's last lecture. Um, so, you know, he was a brilliant guy in many ways and he also as a teacher and he himself had implemented in his design classes a method of self-assessment and peer assessment. So in his classroom, you know, I still remember this an episodic memory of watching the last lecture where he showed the graphs uh, that students got showing how well they did on feedback. So, you know, I don't know how he developed his measures, but basically they saw each week or each month, however how often he did it, where they would work in different teams. And he says, trust me, they learn how well they worked together and they, you know, they worked to get better based upon the feedback that he implemented. So, you know, it was a nice illustration that was, you know, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, but it was eye opening. Um, so in teams that collaboratively problem solve, they often benefit from having a diversity of perspectives on that team. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, in your experience, the role that diversity and inclusion plays in collaborative problem solving. Right. I think um, that's where this notion of education and in, in the care model that really is learning from other team members. So this is where team research comes into play. And a specific example that illustrates the point you're trying to make is information sharing. So we know the diverse inputs is particularly important for complex problem solving because the more you're covering that problem space with the knowledge that comes from people from different uh, backgrounds, the more likely you're gonna come up with a good solution or at least uh, come up with ideas that you can evaluate. So the team research shows that what happens is collaborators rarely talk about uniquely held information. So this is classic social psychology research on the information sharing paradigm. Um, and this has been studied in a number of different contexts where they manipulate uniquely held and common information. And when teams get together, more often than not, they talk about what they all know, not what they uniquely hold. So in your example, if you imagine a diverse team with unique information, more often than not, they're not going to offer what they know. And when diversity includes uh, members from underrepresented communities, you have another layer onto that because not only is it a common practice not to share information, now you have the social problem of, oh, I'm not, I don't feel valued uh, because of my race, my gender, whatever, and they're not contributing because of that reason as well. So this is where the interventions matter. This is where you need to have instruction uh, that shows, hey, look, you're not listening to everybody on that team or everybody's not contributing on that team. So there needs to be some kind of facilitation. You know, maybe you train a team, team leader or maybe you have prompts that they have to go through. Have you heard from everybody on the team? Those kinds of um, interventions would work. Just on. Uh, how about the context dependency? Like, uh, can you consider like a different context when you are searching for the team information seeking and problem solving? Uh, did you see different types of dynamics or different types of interaction and the way it's different, like uh, solving the problems? Uh, well, what kind of contextual differences are you speaking? Um, like, any, like a uh, different type of like, dynamic environment or static environment? So, you know. Well, yeah, I, so one reason I like the CARE model is it has been looked, it has uh, been used in different team contexts. So, you know, I mean, you, you all study a lot of action teams. Um, but collaborative problem solving is not always an action team. More often than not, it's just like a project team where you have a lot of time. You know, it's not a life and death situation. It's not like a short mission that you're on. It's like you have time to reflect on the problem. You come together. There's individual problem solving. There's collaborative problem solving. So I'd say that at the most basic level, it's a difference between an action team, 
um, like emergency management, surgical teams, or versus more of a project team. Like, hey, we need to come up with a new product or we need to you know, come up with a new design for something. So that's a fundamental distinction that is going to modify, uh, but I don't think it's gonna change at a level of difference. It may mediate some of the differences, but these are core collaboration processes that we know are ubiquitous across various team types. Yes. What was the uh, distribution of student scores within each country like? Were the countries that had uh, a hand or a large portion of the very exceptional students, were they skewed, you know, the typical students skewed higher or were there countries that perhaps had a high typical score, but that's because they didn't have any ones who were exceptionally bad or exceptionally good? I don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a bit in the weeds, and, but I, um, I did hear complaints that sometimes the countries keep students at home. <laughs> so my guess is the high scoring countries probably are skewed because they just don't have anyone who's really bad. Because they, but you're sick, you're going to be sick tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> So switching gears a little bit, I know you started off saying that graduate students have an opportunity to really make a change in this. I guess what would be your recommendations for students, session in our program that would be interested in science policy? Um, I'd say get involved with the national organizations um, because that they're the people who should be thinking about these kinds of things. Um, and that's just my bias. So when my students say, hey, there's a local chapter of X, I'm always like, yeah, you can do that, but why don't you go to the national? Um, I did that as a graduate student. So uh, back in my day, the American Psychological Society was the big thing. And I joined that and I was president of the Graduate Student Caucus, which meant I got to sit in on the executive council meetings as a graduate student representative. So I got to listen to what the big players are discussing about the field. So this was back in the 90s before I really thought about science policy, but it was it, these kinds of episodic memories where they're reflecting on the big ideas. They're reflecting on what kind of journals do we want? Because we know that journals shape the kind of research and they shape the way fields progress. So my only point is I wouldn't have gotten that exposure if I joined my local chapter of X. I got to sit at the executive table with all those people and listen to decades of experience, think about these really meta level issues. Uh, but there's also internship programs. Um, AAAS runs these policy internships because they're trying to advocate for these kinds of boundary standards. Um, I know APA has tried to do this, the American Psychological Association. I don't know if any of the engineering um, communities do this, where they try and develop a program for graduate students to get some kind of policy experience. But I'd say just start reading. I mean, um, I'll put it this way. The writing is a lot more accessible than anything you're going to read in an engineering journal or in a math journal. Um, and it's easy reading. You know, it's, it's fun to see um, how policy gets shaped and the history behind the policy. Yeah. I'm curious when those high schoolers were being assessed whether it was in a single day where they had one project or if they were working on maybe a similar project over the course of so the piece of assessment was a, a one shot. So one day? Yeah. Okay. Because I, I know the way I would approach a team collaboration is different if I know it's just going to be like a one-off day or a long meeting versus like a long meeting. Yeah, it was a test. Okay. So that's all, I mean, so it, it had with it all of the associated problems with any kind of test. Okay. It's out of curiosity because uh, different people have different trades. Uh, there's some of us are good and, I mean, you know, about agri work and uh, the ocean, the five guys or something. I don't know if you have, if, if, if there has been any studies on how these people can work in teams or what are, is there any way that you can utilize or just hold them, each one, each person's strength to, to, to enhance the team performance? So somebody is maybe disagreeable, right? Or they have other factors that are really good. How do we leverage those other factors that can help with strength in the team? 
mean, this is from a psychological standpoint. Right. right. So uh, people have tried to use personality as kind of this Rosetta Stone to solve the collaboration process issue where you match complementary personalities. And at best, the, the findings are equivocal. Uh, so sometimes you can get effect, but I don't really think there's one there. And the reason I don't is there's more evidence that group process that is the kinds of things you do about interacting has a greater influence in the composition of that group. And this is, you know, a continual discussion when I give these kinds of talks to universities or agencies, because invariably personality will come up because it's intuitive that people think that that is going to matter. And, and it's also problematic because organizational consultants sell that all of the time. So they'll either develop their own measure or they'll give the Myers Briggs yeah, and they'll go in there. Strength finders, all and, of those and, kind of things that do not tell you what to go to it at and what you're bad at. Them. So the, the, my go to study is one that Google ran a few years ago. And people pay attention to it because it was Google. Uh, and what they did is they wanted to see what made good teams at Google. And um, they were surprised because they thought composition would matter. They thought who was on the team would matter more than what I'm referring to as process. And what they found, which wasn't surprising to those of us who study groups and teams, is that process trumped composition. And the particular process that was important in the Google study was psychological safety. So Amy Edmondson has been studying psychological safety for a number of years, and it's essentially when you create a group norm where people are not afraid to make mistakes, when people are not afraid to take risks to speak out, those are the high performing groups. So at Google, psychological safety creating that norm and the process interventions that are needed to create that norm where you're like, Hey, let that person speak, uh, or, you know, don't insult that person. Don't shout them down. That matters more than the composition. And, um, the simplest way to think about it is the high performing teams made more mistakes and moved on. And they weren't afraid to make mistakes. So they would try things didn't work. They move on low performing teams, you know, they, they were either afraid to try something or if they tried something, they could bog down. But is that the role of the leader to make that those change or to make that environment or is the team altogether that you set that environment? It, it could be, I mean, it depends on what you want to try. I mean, if, if you're a leader based organization, then the team leader should do it. But if you believe in shared leadership, it should, should be something that the entire team owns up to. And the reality is it's going to be a little bit of both. You can't have just a leader pushing that norm down. That does suggest though that individual differences in uh, self-perceived psychological safety might play a role here. So that is a personality factor. Some people get into, into groups and like I never have a problem being the devil's advocate and saying things uh, that I think are right that are in line. Um, and so does that give me like an unfair advantage to shape a group? Or is it rather that uh, the process just might liberate other, I, I guess that I'm answering my question, the process just liberates other people to come up to that level as well. But in groups that don't have a good process, you're still going to have that as a factor that's playing a role, right? Yeah, it depends on how it's received too. So yeah, you, can have, you could have somebody who's an idiot who doesn't, who's like being a devil's advocate with things that are irrelevant, and they can still feel like a lot of psychological safety with nothing to help with mm -hmm. the group. I see. So it would, it would, in the end, it would just wash out. Right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Good job, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> I get time with him later, so okay. that'll be my time. <laughs> well, please uh, come to the barrio. Okay. Right. If you want to ask Dr. Fiore more questions.